take just a few minutes to introduce you to our Ever Ready Battery. Christine Campbell, the boy, she is responsible for the first edition of the minis, and she's going to tell you a little bit about it. Good morning, my name is Christine Campbell Gabor and I'm the Chair of Civics Education and our goal is to educate people in a fun and interesting and innovative way. The first of our minis is Mini Crossword Puzzles. This first series is 100 questions from the citizenship test. If you can answer the questions, you can become a citizen. When Tom and I were becoming citizens, we had 79 Americans over to play wine and wine with us. I would get a glass of wine, and he would let me whine about having to ask the questions. And out of those 79 people, two would have been able to pass. Yikes. We need to have an educated public so that they can make an educated decision on the issues that are important to them. These are going to be five series. This first series is complete. The second series is questions from a grade seven textbook, which will help us get in and talk to the kids and be educated. The third one will be Palm Beach County. That will be out before September, so that you will have a tool to find out why you should vote for the Port Authority, why things are happening, what's happening local, because your local elections are more important than the national ones in many ways because they are the reason that you may have the most impact on you. We're then going to have something called mini videos, which Naya and Christina are going to be working on with a bunch of us which are going to explain the amendments, which are going to show us in short YouTube type videos how to get things done, how to vote by mail. They'll be really fun and interesting, and if you have ideas, I love ideas, bring them to me. She and the committee have really done a marvelous job. This is a bestseller. Um, yes. where we are off offering it actually to links all over the country. Well, our favorite columnist is here with us today. He writes with sarcasm and hard-hitting words. He goes for the juggler when things are unjust and he knows how to bring attention to a situation. I mean, you know, he's protecting us to make sure we can have popcorn in the movie lobby. <laughs> if you haven't read his column today, go home and you know why I said that. Yup, Frank writes a column that makes us notice, that makes us wince, that can get us upset, and makes us consider the issue. And on the way, he makes us laugh. What a gift. How lucky we are to have him out of the newspaper and to be with us today. As someone with a music background, he plays the accordion, of course, because his last name ends in a vowel. <laughs> and he also plays a soulful saxophone. So are you ready? Here yeah. comes Frank. <laughs> Can you hear me in the back? Yes. Okay. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen and uh, assorted emotional support animals. <laughs> I'm sure somebody must have an emotional support animal. I'm thinking of getting one, actually. I was a little dismayed, though. This week, uh, American Airlines has created some new restrictions. I don't know if you saw this on emotional support animals. Apparently, you can't bring on an animal that has hooves and horns, <laughs> which includes goats. Uh, so if you have an emotional support goat, do not fly American. I recommend Delta. <laughs> anyway, so it's good to be here. I, uh, I probably should talk about something to do with elections. And, I, and I, I'm surprised, first of all, to see so many men at the League of Women Voters. And I don't know what you guys are up to. <laughs> doing here, but I wish you luck. I, uh, I wish, speaking of 
wishing you luck. I, I, I don't envy the, the League of Women Voters for the job they have to do um, this, this election season. We have these, uh, I mean, the ballot's going to look like a cheesecake factory menu by the time we get through all this stuff. And, and somebody's going to have to explain what vaping has to do with offshore drilling. I'm not sure why those two things are in one vote, but you have to decide whether judges should be 75 years old and whether victims should be notified in the same, uh, in the same question. It's crazy. I don't know. I, I, I think back, when I think back, I, sort of, I said, well, you know, I had to talk about something to do with elections, and I'm, I'm thinking back. Every time I, I think of elections, I think back to the year of 2000, November of 2000. How many people were here at uh, that time? Yeah. Well, that was the death of paper ballots. I've been here long enough to know that we would be much better off going back to paper ballots, hanging chats, dangling chats, and all. Yeah, I know. I, I kind of think we got a great education on all the things that could go wrong in one election that year, you know? And it's like it would inoculate us from making further mistakes. But now we're, have, now we're worried about election security, not on a retail level, but on a wholesale level, that somebody could get into to get into the system and hack our hack our election system and, 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 uh, and, and, and do catastrophic things where we don't even see it. And we're almost better off having a system where everybody has a little punch card, right? You stick, you punch through the holes, and if you don't, if you don't remove the dangling chad, well, then it's your own fault. But uh, if you remove the dangling chad, it's going to count as a vote. And uh, so I don't know. But I, I will, I will tell a couple stories from that election. Two favorite uh, uh, stories of mine that uh, from then. So that was the first time. So I've been writing a column here since 1991 or two. And uh, that was uh, eight years later. And I had never been, you know, I write a local column. So there's no reason for me to have any sort of a national audience or anything. But suddenly when the election and the recount happened and Palm Beach County became a focus of the recount, the whole national media swooped down to, to, uh, to Palm Beach County because we could have gone to Jacksonville, but who wants to stay in Jacksonville? And so, yeah, really, Jacksonville had a lot of problems. They had tens of thousands of overvotes. They could have very easily done the story of the screwed up Florida elections from Jacksonville. Jacksonville had a, root, a rookie supervisor of elections who completely botched the ballot design. They had a ballot that stretched over two pages in Jacksonville. So half the presidential candidates were on this page, and the other half were on this page. And people went and voted, and they thought it was like a Chinese menu. You get to pick one from this side and one from this side. So they would pick Gore or Bush, and then they would say, oh, do I go for the Socialist or the Constitutional Party here? And they would do, they think, you know, you got a second vote. All those votes were invalidated, tens of thousands of votes. So you could have done the election from there, but like I said, who wants to go to Jacksonville when you can stay at the Breakers or the Chesterfield or someplace in Palm Beach and cover the election from Palm Beach? Plus, we had the infamous butterfly ballot, so that helped to, to, make, it, uh, to make it sort of, uh, you know, legitimate to, to expense uh, all these expensive hotels and meals. And so the national media came down here, and then they had to justify their expenses. So they started doing shows here. And that's what gave me sort of a break. Because the first time I got to be on CNN, I'm going, I show up at work, I'm in my office, and office. It's a desk in a big open area. I'm there, and my editor, who had an office, walks out and says, hey, Frank, would you like to be on CNN? And I said, yes. I would like to be on CNN, as I'd never been on national news before, and I thought this could be the break I was looking for. <laughs> and let me remind you, that was 18 years ago. So, <laughs> so you know the rest of the story. But uh, so, so I thought, this is great. And it turns out there was a show called Talk Back Live, and it's usually, usually done at the time in the CNN Center in Atlanta. But they decided, like everybody else, to come down to Palm Beach County and do something down here. So they set up at Palm Beach Atlantic University, the small Christian school there in downtown West Palm Beach, and they used the gymnasium and turned it into a TV studio and used the students as their studio TV audience. And they would do this talk show instead of at the CNN Center, they would do it at this college in West Palm. And they would do it every day for a while while the recount was going on. So somebody who was a booker from CNN called up and said, we're having a panel discussion about Palm Beach County, and we'd like you, if the newspaper has one person you can send to be on this panel, that would be great. 
So my editor says, would you like to be on the panel? And I said, yes. So I show up. Well, before I show up, I call my mother. Because you'll appreciate this. Uh, uh, like most of you now, I have adult children, so I know how kids work. But, you know, at the time, you know, when you have, when you have children and they get to be adults, uh, you know, the girls tell you way too much, but you, way too much, and the boys tell you nothing, you know? And, uh, given the choice, I'd rather have the boys, but, but uh, no, but so I, my mother would always pump me for information, and she's back in uh, New York, in Long Island, you know, so she would always ask me what's going on, and I would call every week, and I would just say nothing, you know, I have nothing, everything's fine, how's work, good, you know, that kind of thing, and then I would hang up, and be, okay, I've done that. But now I thought, this will be great. I'll tell my mom I'm going to be on TV and it will be something to talk about. So before I head over to the, to the school to do the CNN show, I call up my mother in Long Island, Bayshore, Long Island, if you have to know. You have to tell me. When you talk about Long Island, people want to know, like, what block? You know, it's very specific. So many people are from Long Island, you can't just say that. You have to say you know, what, what school you went to. Anyway, so I... Um, I call her up and I said, Mom, uh, you ought to turn on the television this afternoon at 3 o'clock. I'm going to be on CNN. And she says, yes, but will you be on my CNN? <laughs> my mother never lived any place outside of New York. And her view of the world, of especially America, was like that New Yorker cartoon where there are little islands of culture uh, separated by a vast wasteland. And so. To her, any place south of Exit 9 on the New Jersey Turnpike, is, people are basically marrying their cousins and eating squirrels. You know, that's, that's, that's. So she figured there's no way people in Florida would get the same level of CNN that the sophisticates in New York would get. That New Yorkers would get the CNN that's made for intelligent people, where we would get the dumbed down Florida version, you know, with maybe subtitles and things like that. So I told her, I said, Mom, you are you are really wrong here. We get the same CNN that you get. She goes, Oh, okay. And I said, Turn it on, three o'clock. So I go over to the school. And I'm a little nervous, like I said, I hadn't been on TV before, and I would have worn a better tie if I knew I was going to be on TV that day. And, um, and I show up and I'm told, okay, this is what it's going to be like. We picked four people, and we're going to talk about what it's like in Florida, and uh, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're, you're one of the four people, and now you got to go put on your makeup. So I go to this room there, I'm getting my makeup on with the other people in this panel. And the other people in this panel happen to be Alcee Hastings, Mary McCarty and Greta Van Susteren. This is like, this is like you go to hell and we're the first four people that greet you there. You know, it's like we have an impeached federal judge who became a congressman because I guess Florida. I don't know. And then, and then a county commissioner who had not yet gone to prison but would in a few years. And Greta Van Susteren, who was not go to Fox yet, but would in a few years. And, uh, and Greta Van Susteren wasn't even a local person. She was just, it turned out that she and her husband owned a sailboat. And so she was making the best of this recount by having the sailboat come down to West Palm. It was docked outside of uh, the, uh, uh, the Intracoastal. And they were living on the sailboat for a month, having a lovely time. And they felt like they were locals. And they weren't. <laughs> So they said, okay, here's what we're going to do. We'll have uh, Frank and Greta, you can be on the first panel, and then we're going to take a commercial break, and then we'll bring out Alcy and Mary for the second panel. I think, okay, fine. So like, we go and they sit down, we we'll go in, Greta and I go into the, uh, into the gymnasium, and, and we sit down, and the audience, all the students there, and they're, and they're getting them all riled up. And then the host walks in, and the host of the show, as somebody that, uh, there's no really, her name is Bobby Batista, and there's no real charitable way of saying this, but she is cross-eyed. So, <laughs> so when she asks a question, everybody answers. <laughs> it was the most unnerving thing. You know, we're sitting there, Greta and I are both talking over each other, because we're not sure, I don't know what's going on. I'm thinking like, oh my God, this is gonna be my first time on television. It's a disaster. And then we get ready for the show, and they start doing it. You can hear the theme music starting, and the lights pop on. We're getting ready to go on, and suddenly, 
the lights go off and some producer or something announces, we've been preempted, there's breaking news. <laughs> so I thought, oh, well maybe Al Gore has decided to give up the recount. And it turns out, no, what it was, was that Al Gore, who I guess had a home someplace in Northern Virginia, uh, decided to step outside his door and toss a football with one of his boys, one of his sons. <laughs> Just as I, I assume it's a way of showing that he's very carefree and is not worried about the recount and is so relaxed that he's just tossing around a football. And, uh, and so somebody in Atlanta had to make a decision. All right, do we continue on with this show down in this gymnasium in Florida or do we go and show Al Gore playing football? And they said, let's show Al Gore playing football. So I got preempted, and then by the time he got through playing football, my segment was done, they moved on. I go back to the office, take my makeup off, you know. My, the phone rings, my mother calls up, she says, I told you we'd get a different CNN. We had Al Gore playing football, we didn't have to. I did have one of the most magical experiences I've ever had as a, as a, uh, as a, as a journalist uh, in, in down here uh, in that same period of time. Uh, so every day, you know, during the recount lasted 37 days. And it was, and if, for those of you who don't remember or weren't here, so what happened was that uh, the, uh, there was a question, because of these paper ballots and because they had these little hanging pieces of cardboard that sometimes didn't get totally punched through, Every time they fed through a machine, the machine reads the light made by an empty hole. But if that little tag under it wasn't completely missing, sometimes when it fed through the machine, that little tag would close up the hole and it would not read as a vote. And other times it would be open. And so every time you, you fed the ballots for Palm Beach County, you got a different answer, which made people uh, anxious, especially when the whole margin of the election was maybe a few hundred votes. So the decision was made was that we'd have to visually inspect every one of the ballots cast in Palm Beach County and hold them up and try to determine the intent of the voter because that was the standard. The standard in Florida law isn't whether or not you screwed up when voting. It's the intent of the voter. So if you had taken one of those paper ballots and ignored all the directions and just wrote, I vote for George W. Bush and, and wrote it in pen and did that, you, your vote would be counted because it's clear what that means. So now the canvassing board, which is made up of three members, has to decide the intent of the voter by looking at these ballots where the holes aren't all the way punched through. So they had some holes where not only was there no hole, but there was, a, there was just an indentation on one of the votes for the candidates. And so then the, the Democrat would say, if, it, if that happened to be an Al Gore indentation, which they, by the way they called a pregnant chat, if that was that, they would say, they would say, well, that voter clearly meant to vote for Al Gore, so we should count this as an Al Gore vote. And the Republican would say, no, that was a check swing. They started to vote for Al Gore, and they just couldn't make themselves do it, and they pulled off. So the intent of the voter isn't clear, so you can't count it. What's interesting, so each side got to have lawyers from the party sitting behind you. The lawyer that the Republicans used in Palm Beach County was John Bolton. Remember that when he starts World War III. So, um, so um, anyway, so, so there was all this question about how they were gonna count the votes. The other thing was, some voters just went, and so there were 10 candidates, they punched out nine holes. So they said, okay, well like, clearly what that means is that the one hole they didn't punch out must be who they wanted to vote for. They said, no, you can't count that either because maybe that was, you know, they would say I'd vote for anybody but this guy. And that was a political stake. So, so that's what this canvassing board had to face. And the members of the canvassing board was a supervisor of elections at that time, Teresa LaFour, Carol Roberts, who was a, a member of the Palm Beach County Commission, and, the, and, there, and this is by statute. So it's set up so that the supervisor of election is one of the members, one of the county commissioners, and they have one of the judges in the county court judges. And it's usually the booby prize for being in the county court uh, because they, they get the most rookie judge and you get to be the one on the canvassing board. So what it means is usually really completely boring work where you show up on a municipal election from like the city of South Palm Beach and verify that all 28 votes were cast legally. 
but, uh, but in this case, it would have national implication. Whoever won Florida would win the election. The next president would be decided by, by Florida, and there were enough votes in Palm Beach County to sway the election either way. So depending on how they handled those ballots would be a determining factor on who would get to be president. So there was a lot of interest in there. And for 37 days, Carol Roberts and Teresa LaCour and the, the county court judge was named Chuck Burton, Charles Burton was the county court judge at the time. Those three people sat there with lawyers over their shoulders arguing about what they should see or shouldn't see, determining whether the pregnant hanging and dangling Chad should determine intent or not. And, and they went through every vote of everybody. And there was a lawsuit involved in the, in, the, uh, in the election process, which got went to the Florida Supreme Court, and the Democrats made a really bad mistake, is that instead of pushing for a recount in all 67 Florida counties, they kind of cynically just picked four counties where they thought they would have more votes. So they picked Miami-Dade, Broward, Palm Beach County, and Volusia County, where Daytona is, and they only wanted recounts in those four counties. And ultimately, that doomed them because uh, on, on their uh, equal, uh, uh, equal treatment under the law, 14th Amendment argument, it, it meant that voters in these four counties would have rights or would have, would have their votes counted in a way that was different from other voters in Florida. That kind of doomed the recount, at least according to the Supreme Court. But before this decision was made, there was a case. And then the case was heard. There was oral arguments in Washington, D.C. before the Supreme Court, before the justices ruled. And so after 37 days of the recount, uh, there was a hearing before the, the Supreme Court, and, uh, and Charles Burton, who was one of the members of the county uh, canvassing board, uh, flew to Washington to sit at the table with the lawyers from Palm Beach County to, to argue on behalf of the county, and the case was, was Bush v. Gore. And uh, so my editors at the newspaper said, you know, you know Judge Burton, right? And I did. I used to cover the courthouse for the Miami Herald before I worked for the Palm Beach Post, and I, and I knew uh, Charles Burton when he was a prosecutor, before he was a judge, and we were friendly. And I said, yes, I, I know him. And they said, why don't you go to Washington, D.C. with him and write a story about, about him going to the Supreme Court uh, to, hear this, uh, to listen to this case? So I said, well, I'll see. Because I had been spending days outside where they were counting the ballots, and, he, and Chuck would smoke, so he'd come out and smoke. And I would talk to him, and he would say, I can't do interviews with anybody. Uh, everybody in the world wants to interview me. So the only thing, I'm, uh, to be fair, I'm not letting anybody interview me. I don't, I'm not doing any interviews with anybody. Connie uh, Chung had sent flowers to his house. I mean, there were people that were taking extraordinary measures to try to get him to talk to them. And he said, I don't want to seem to be like a media person, like somebody who's trying to use my, my five minutes of fame to cash in. So I've decided I'm not going to do any media. And I said, okay, I, you know, I, actually I, I felt like he, that was a, a really decent thing to do. So I didn't push him anything. So then my editor said, no, we want you to go and go with him. And, I'm, and I said, there, he doesn't want to talk to me or anybody else. You know, he really doesn't. And they said, try. So I said, okay. So I call him up and I said, you're, you go to Washington, D.C., and I'm thinking maybe I'll go with you. He goes, I'm not, when I'm doing it in any interviews, I said, okay, I, right, I'm not going to do it in any interviews, but I want to go. So what airline do you want? So he said, well, I'm on U.S. Air, you know, leaving West Palm Beach at such and such a time. I said, okay. So I call up the airline, and I say, yeah, yeah hi, I'd like to book a flight on this flight, and if there's any way I can sit next to my good friend Chuck Burton, that would be terrific. <laughs> so they put me next to him on the plane. <laughs> We're not going to talk, right? We're not going to. I'm not going to interview him, right? We're going to talk, whatever. So, I'm thinking, okay, this plan could work out. So, I go to the airport, and I get on the plane, and I'm sitting next to somebody who's not Chuck Burton, and the seats are all full, and Chuck Burton isn't there, and I'm thinking, oh my God, I bet you he's on a different plane. So then I start walking off the plane, and he's sitting in first class, and I say, Chuck, what are you doing in first class? He goes. I went to check in and they said, you're the judge from the trial. You know what, we're just bumping you to first class. All the stuff that you've been through, you're, you get to ride first class to Washington. Thank you for your service. And I said, oh, that's great. <laughs> so now I'm sitting back in coach and I'm thinking, now what am I gonna do, you know? So the plane lands at uh, Reagan uh, National Airport in Washington and of course the first class is already out. So by the time I get off the plane, I'm run through the terminal like OJ, you know, and, and looking for Chuck Burton. And I get out to the cab stand, and there he is standing out there. So I kind of come up next to him, and it's like, 
Oh, hey, Chuck, how you doing? Uh, and, I, and I said, where are you staying? <laughs> so he says, I oh, he names the hotel. Oh, hi, at Capitol Hill. I said, oh. He said, where are you staying? And I said, I'm staying at the high Capitol Hill. Yeah, that's where I'm staying. I think I'm, yeah, I think I'm gonna stay in the same place. That sounds good. And I said, hey, I tell you what, you know, he was on a per diem, like some ridiculous $35 a day thing. And I said, listen, I'm expensing everything with the newspaper. Why don't I pay for the cab? You know, we're both going to the same hotel. Get in my cab. So he says, okay. You know, so, so we get in the cab, we go to the hotel. We get in line for the concierge or whatever. And, uh, and uh, we're waiting. And it goes up, and, and he says, yes, I have a room, you know, Burton. And, and they say, checking in, and the, and the guy says, would you like a king-size bed or two double beds? <laughs> so he pauses, and he looks back at me, and he says, Frank, did you already book your room? I said, <laughs> I said no, Chuck, actually, I didn't. He goes, you want to bunk it together? <laughs> I pretended to consider it. <laughs> I said, yeah, yeah, let's do that. That would be great. That would be great. So here we are, two married guys, and we check into this hotel at like five at night. The hearing's not till the next morning. And we're like, turn on the TV, and there he is on TV, you know, and it's like, I don't want to watch TV. He turns the TV off. And so we go to dinner. We're meeting, uh, we're meeting the lawyers from the case, Bruce Rogo and a few other people, these constitutional lawyers. And so we have, and they're there with their wives, you know. So we have dinner, and then it's like, they all leave with their wives, and it's Chuck and I again, you know. And, it's like, and now it's like 7 o'clock at night, and it's like the thought of going back and sitting on our under and watching TV all night, it's just, you know, and I'm not, haven't talked to him about the case, but I'm not interviewing him, you know, that was the whole thing, I'm not interviewing him. So I said, okay, well, we're not talking about it, all right, so, so it's like we're like a couple that's having a fight, you know, so, uh, so, so then he says, well, I don't want to go back to the hotel room, and I said, well, I don't want to go back to the hotel room either, and he says, well, how about, he said, have you ever seen the Supreme Court before? And, and I said, yeah, I, I've driven by it. I've never been inside. He goes, I've never even seen the building. I said, well, let's go walk over there. It's not far from here. We'll go walk to the Supreme Court. So it was a cold night in, uh, I think it was December still, and we walked to the Supreme Court building, and it was lit up. It was like a birthday cake, just lit up. A beautiful, you know, Gothic, you know, building. And, and, and there were thousands of people outside. It was shocking. I thought it would just be an empty thing. And it was shocking because the oral arguments were set for the next morning, and there were people who were planning. It was 40 degrees out. There were people who were planning to spend the night sitting outside in sleeping bags, waiting for a chance to have 15 minutes in the visitor's gallery to watch the arguments in this case, because it was such a historical case. And most of them, I would say most of them, 99.9% .9 of them, were political science majors from like GW and Georgetown, and there were just young kids who were just like, just like today, the way the young kids have gotten wrapped up in Parkland and, and, and all the gun stuff, they were wrapped up in this election in a way that they hadn't been before. And, uh, and it was to them, this was like history had come to their doorstep and they didn't want to miss it. So if it meant sitting out and playing Yahtzee all night, you know, in 40 degree temperatures, you know, well, that was it. Well, to them, the greatest president in the world was when Charles Burton showed up. It was like Elvis arrives at your room. Because these were kids that were willing to sacrifice a whole night of discomfort to be in this, near in the proximity of this thing. And of course, they recognized him just on first sight. They'd watched 37 Days in the Recount. He, his face had become so familiar. We got within like 50 yards of that place and somebody else, the judge is here. And it was like, and he had no idea because he had been in this bubble for all this time. He had no idea that he was even known outside of anything, you know? And he was suddenly besieged by everybody. And they just like loved him to death. And he, to him, it was like invalidated, you know, all the, the stuff he had gone through. And so we just spent like two hours with him just being, going, talking to the kids and just walking around. And I didn't ask him a question. I just took out my notebook and I just reported what all the other people asked him. And, and it was, yeah, it was wonderful. It was better than anything. Like I, I teach a journalism class now and I say, you know, sometimes just being there is better than opening your damn mouth, you know, because sometimes you know, watching the way people talk to other people is much more true and revealing and honest than how they would answer a question to a reporter knowing that, oh, I'm saying something that's going to be in print or something like that. And his reaction and his interaction with all those kids, that became my column. 
and, and put it on the front page the next day. And I was really proud of that column because it was like a mission impossible. I got a column when I didn't even talk to the person I was doing anything about. It. And he was completely happy with it because he didn't appear to be somebody looking for publicity. And he wasn't really looking for publicity. He was just a nice guy and he was kind of helping out a friend, but he wasn't looking for publicity. And, and, and yet, it really told the story of the election and his role in the election and how people saw him in a way that, that made him feel good about what he had done. And, uh, and it was really funny. So my editors are thinking they sent me on this fool's errand and they started to feel bad. <laughs> so they called me and they said, Frank, we're, you know, are you able to, to, to see Chuck? You know, how, how are you doing in Washington? And I said, able to see him, I said, we're sleeping together. <laughs> One of my proudest moments. Yeah. So then, unfortunately, a month later, they sent me to, to follow Teresa Lepore, and I warned him right off the bat, we will not be sleeping together. I, just, I don't want to get your expectations up too high. Uh, I am, uh, I am uh, reminded, this is the weekend. How many people are going to watch the royal wedding this weekend? No. Really? Yeah, all well, the guys are moaning no, but all the women are saying yeah, of course. Um, you know, uh, the, uh, I, one of the, some people say, well, you know, what do you do? You know, what are your journalistic accomplishments? And I don't have a lot of, you know, when I was a reporter, and General Simon reported and other things, I had done serious stuff that, that resulted in, you know, people going to jail, things like that. But now when you're a columnist, especially when you're a Yuma columnist, it's, um, you just kind of entertain people for the most part. And so like when I think back on my accomplishments, other than making people laugh occasionally, is that occasionally I get myself disinvited to events, which I, I consider an accomplishment. And one of them has to do with the royal family. I, I don't get to write about the royal family very often, only when they come here. And at one time, uh, Prince Charles, was speaking at the Society of the Four Arts, and I was supposed to cover it. I wrote an advance on it, and I think I said something that irritated the, the royal, um, whatever those people are, those handlers that handle the royal family. I think I mentioned that Edward was the auxiliary queen. I think that was my, <laughs> something. I said something that was very rude. I might have said something nice about the American Revolution or something, but. <laughs> But I got, a, I got word from the, uh, the royal office that, that uh, my credential had been pulled for the event and I was not, I was not able to uh, attend the event, which didn't break my heart. So, so when I think back on it, the other thing too, that this is a, I'm gonna read you this column because it's, uh, this is another thing that I did. I actually, and I feel a little bit of regretful for this, but I'll, I'll read you the column and then, I'll, and then you'll, you'll explain. By the way, uh, I am hawking some books here today. So um, I have a, a few years ago, the paper asked me to, to come up with a collection of my favorite columns. And so I went through it, it was a, it was a lot of fun. I gave them 600 columns. And they said, no, we want like 100. So, um, so this, this is the filet of the best. So, um, but it's called Writing Like a Taller Person. And, uh, and the reason is that I, when I first started writing, I went to an event and this uh, woman who invited me looked at me and she said, you're Frank Cherubino, you write like a taller person. <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't know if she was complimenting my writing or making a dig on my height, you know? And then somebody else said the same exact thing a few years later. So when it came time to come up with a name for a you know, collection of my columns, I, I called it writing like a taller person. But anyway, here's one. And, and I'll, I'll explain the regret I have after this. Okay. Now it's official. What gets flushed down toilets in Palm Beach really doesn't stink. I suspected as much. People in the town have always acted that way. But now I find out it's literally true. The town public works department puts perfume scents in the sewer system every week. Vanilla, cherry, citrus. This is lilac week. All over town, the rich and famous are pushing the lever and sending another bouquet coursing through the dark. <laughs> Fragrant underbelly of this gilded care for city. Palm Beachers have a fixation with disposal issues. That's why there's daily garbage pickup, no cemeteries, and perfumed sewers. Sure, you can mock them, but I won't. I'm jealous. I checked with Boca Raton where I live and found out that my contributions to the wastewater system get rather rough, rough treatment. Fragrances don't help remove the hydrogen sulfide, explained Boca's utilities director, James Chancellor. They just hide it. 
You can either mask or filter odors, he said. Boca filters the odors through caustic soda and activated carbon. Caustic soda, activated carbon. It sounds so brutal. Nothing like a vanilla treatment. <laughs> the fragrances used in Palm Beach don't do anything to the hydrogen sulfide, the rotten egg smell that breeds in sewers. They just overpower that stink with a more pleasant smell. It's like putting on aftershave without taking a shower, explained Eric Olson, the director of utilities in West Palm Beach. So in other words, it's a pleasant, sweet facade over a stinking, rotting pustule of foulness. Sounds like a metaphor for Palm Beach itself. <laughs> Lake Worth and West Palm Beach do some dabbling in the fragrant uh, sewer trade, too. But the people there don't have their hearts into it the way Palm Beach does. It's a strange psychology using these things, Olson said. We've had people complain about the fragrances we use. So West Palm Beach also uses something called aluminol, a fragrance that doesn't smell. Sounds pretty wimpy to me, like playing for a tie. I'm with Palm Beach. Go all the way. Make it fruity. <laughs> now you're probably saying to yourself, gee, I was walking in Palm Beach recently, and I didn't notice any cherry aroma drifting up through the sewers. That's because you really can't smell it. If you smell it, it would be an accident, the town's public works director said. We don't want it wafting about the town. Unless you go rooting around in the pump station, you won't know what the fragrance of the week is. Some of you might be saying, then why bother? But you're thinking of this the wrong way. Don't look at it as sanitation. Think of it as conceptual art. <laughs> Let me explain. In 1977, artist Walter Di Maria drilled in a one, a one kilometer deep hole into the ground, put a one kilometer long brass rod in the hole, and then covered the hole with a metal plate. It cost $300,000 to do this. His piece entitled Vertical Kilometer was a great work of conceptual art. You couldn't actually see it, but you knew it was there. It's the same thing with lilac-scented sewer water. Just knowing it's there makes all the difference. It's not disgusting, it's art. So for you people on the mainland, next time you find yourself in the restroom of a Palm Beach restaurant, pull the lever with confidence, knowing that in some small way, you made the world a little sweeter. You'll have to imagine that several yards under your feet, there's a liquid garden of lilac, a fragrant memento of Mother Nature, from the island of the beautiful people. <laughs> so my regret was that after I wrote it, they canceled the fragrance of the week. <laughs> that wasn't my intent. I was celebrating them, and it made him feel silly. And they said, OK, we won't have the fragrances anymore. <laughs> I don't know. I've been disinvited by Donald Trump, too, but that's another story. No, <laughs> no, it's OK. All right, I'll tell you, I'll tell you this one more thing. All right, so. Uh, I, over the years, I've written various things about him. I mean, he's really, I should donate part of my salary to him. He's was wonderful for me. Bad for you, but wonderful for me. Uh, and so there was a time when, um, you know, he wanted to move the airport because the, uh, the planes were flying over his house, and, he, and that didn't work. And so then he sued over the airport. And so as part of a settlement, the county agreed to, uh, he dropped the suit, and the county agreed to give him a pretty a uh, good lease for the land around the airport, which is where he put Trump International Golf Course, and the county gave him a 75-year lease, so uh, pretty good terms. And so he kind of used the lawsuit as leverage to get the land cheaply from the county. So then he built the golf course, but the problem with the golf course, just like the airport, is that its, its proximity to things he would rather not see was there. So uh, right next to the golf course on the north end was the Palm Beach County Jail. <laughs> And it was a, uh, it was not a very, it still isn't a very attractive looking building. And so if golfers are paying all these big initiation fees and then they're, they're on this course, this beautiful course, all these berms, they come around the corner and there's this 12 story bunker with barbed wire around it and they asked Trump what it was and he of course told them, it's the courthouse. <laughs> But that wasn't good enough. So he called up the sheriff at the time, it was Bob Newman, uh, and he called up the sheriff and he said, Sheriff, uh, is there any way you can move the jail? <laughs> it's, really, it's really hurting the sight lines in the dark. <laughs> so the sheriff kind of said, no, there isn't. And then, God bless him, he went, the sheriff called me up and said, Frank, I've got one for you. <laughs> <laughs> he said, Trump just told me I need to move the jail. I said, Bob, I'm on it right away. <laughs> so, so this is one case where you know 
you got a column and you know you want to write something about it, but you got to come up, come up with like a premise that's somewhat imaginative, you know, so you're not just writing. I mean, the joke is just, just telling it to you the way it is is funny enough, but the, I wanted to kind of make it extra funny. So what I decided to do was, I, I, I told I, the readers in the column, I said, you know, uh, Donald Trump wants to move the jail, and we really can't move the jail, but maybe we can come halfway. We can disguise the jail so it looks like a luxury hotel. <laughs> we would know it's the jail, but the outsiders might think it's a luxury hotel. And the way to do that is to put a sign on the jail that will serve two purposes. To outsiders, I'm familiar with the area, it would look like the name for a hotel, but to us, we would know it's the jail. So I had a contest, and uh, who could come up with the best rename the jail contest? So um, the entries were really great, and I couldn't decide. I had two entries that were so good, I decided that I was going to split it. Uh, and the, the first one was bar a lot <laughs> <laughs> And the next one was the Breakers Inn. <laughs> The column ran, and then he threatened to sue me. Of course, he didn't sue me. And then he had the grand opening for the golf course, and he told the paper, anybody can cover it except for Frank Church. <laughs> and so I know he gets a lot of credit for being this master negotiator and everything, but that is exactly the worst thing to do, is to tell a journalist you can't write about something when you know the guy has already been making a fortune writing off of you that have been feasting on your on your carcass for years, and and now you're basically giving him another free shot. At, you know, it's really it's not a smart thing to do. And so, what do you think happened? Who covered the opening of the golf course? I did. So I I didn't get on the property, but that was okay because the sheriff let me into the top floor of the jail. So I, <laughs> so I covered it from the jail. <laughs> Can't see much up here, but it's beautiful. That, you know, it's like, <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, all right. So I, I do have these. I will autograph them if you like. I will autograph them. They're ten dollars. Uh, and uh, that's you know you have it. They're they're great for bathroom reading. You know, they, you know if you read more than one column. Get the Metamucil. I recommend the Metamucil. <laughs> if anybody has any questions, though, before I wrap up, I think I have a couple minutes here. If anybody has a uh, question, yes? Yeah. Thank you for your wonderful presentation, as usual. And, but touching on what's going on here now, uh, a professor, I think, in Central Florida said that there's a kind of a blue wave coming, except not in Florida, because the seniors keep moving in here and they vote. Therefore, don't expect a blue wave here. What's your thoughts on that? Okay, so the question for those in the back that couldn't hear was that there's, if you watch uh, cable news and want to read a lot of you know newspapers, there's there is a there's a seems to be the conventional wisdom is <coughs> that 2018 is going to be sort of a sea change in politics, and it's been called the blue wave, where the Democrats have been doing better than they they had in 2016 in some of these House races and special elections, and the idea is that they may sweep through in 2018 and do, and do better across the country, but not in Florida, as a, as a gentleman said, because uh, Florida has some different dynamics. There's a constant influx of retirees, and uh, those retirees are coming from uh, places where they, they may be Trump voters, uh, you know, places even in the, uh, in the Northeast where there's uh, uh, you know, a lot of Trump voters, and, and that may, they may uh, make Florida sort of uh, an outlier in this. And I don't, I don't have a crystal ball. I, I will say it's really interesting, though, that uh, I, I watch the way Rick Scott is campaigning. Uh, you know, he clearly, clearly in Florida, every vote counts. Uh, the fact that he's gone to Puerto Rico in, in, in Israel to campaign for Florida <laughs> shows you that Florida is really, the politics of Florida is really international and, and, and also relies on, on people coming into the state. Uh, so. So there's a, there's a big, uh, the con conventional wisdom was that after the hurricane, Maria, whatever, the one that devastated Puerto Rico, that 
thousands of, of, uh, of Puerto Ricans would, would flock into Orange County and the, the central uh, Florida counties where they're a pretty high Puerto Rican population already, and they would tend to vote Democrat, and that might swing the state. Uh, but I've seen <coughs> stories very recently that many of them haven't really registered to vote, and that, is, that the effect of this of this Puerto Rican influx is a lot less than than uh, than advertised at first. I've also seen I've also seen uh, stuff about uh, that that Republicans tend to do well in Florida uh, when they turn out their voters in the northern parts of the, the uh, of the state, in the Panhandle and in Jacksonville. And so any kind of perceived uh, you know blue wave in Florida will just make the the counterbalance to that higher. They'll just get higher turnout in, in, in their parts of the state. So I don't, really, I don't really have a crystal ball. I do think the big wild card, of course, is what Bob Mueller does. Uh, it, it almost seems, I, 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 I've been on the side of the road, you know, when, when Trump goes by, you know, going back and forth to, to Mar-a-Lago, and there'd be people, you know, a group of people who'd be out there with, with signs that say impeach him, and then a group of people say thank you, President Trump, and standing next to each other. And they're two separate worlds, and they're, and they're like silos of, of things they think are important, and there's almost no intersection. But I do think that if Robert Mueller actually comes through with, with findings that are, that are so um, hard to ignore that, that, that congressional Republicans uh, get cold feet, uh, it, will, it will create a kind of wobble that, that breaks this, this stalemate that we're in. I really think that we're in this stalemate where it's almost like whether you're liberal or, or Republican or conservative, there's almost nothing you can learn that will change your vote. Uh, but that may, that may change with this, I'm not sure. And then again, it could be that Mueller comes up with something that says, well, there's a lot of bad things, but uh, I'll leave it up to you what to do. And then the Republican uh, House will say, well, geez, nothing, I guess. You know, so, I mean, that's also a, a possibility. So, anybody else? Okay, well, thank you. You've been very good. I appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of your day.